Hello, everyone, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative and the Aquatic and Riparian Ecosystem Management Team, which many of you also know is the Critical Management Question 1 team here at the Desert LCC. My name is Matt Graybaugh. I'm the Science Coordinator for the Desert LCC. We're very pleased to have Karen Schlaughter present to us today on a Desert LCC-funded project that addresses the interaction of different factors on groundwater support uh, for riparian areas in the Colorado River Delta. Karen is the Adaptive Management Specialist for the Colorado River Delta Program at Sonoran Institute, and she's been working in the Delta since 2010. Karen manages the Delta Restoration and Ecological Monitoring Programs and guides, guides adaptive management of restoration sites in the Delta. She is the co-manager of the Minute 319 Binational Monitoring Team and specializes in vegetation monitoring and riparian restoration ecology. As many of you guys know, I had the privilege of working with Karen for several years in the Delta before I started in this current position, and I'm excited to have the presentation today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Karen. Thanks, Matt, and hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining the presentation today, and thanks especially to the Desert FCC um, for funding this project. Um, just to give a little more background on Snorin Institute, for those who aren't familiar with our organization, we're a conservation nonprofit organization that's based in Tucson, Arizona. Um, and we have a field office in, in Phoenix and one in Mexicali, Mexico. And we really work at the nexus of communities and conservation to find solutions that are good for the environment and economies and people. Um, and as Matt said, uh, we have a long history of working in the Delta. We've been working there for the last 20 years and um, started restoration in about 2006. So this project is, is a really interesting one because it's allowing us to sort of um, predict how future impacts of climate change or changes in water management might affect remnant riparian habitat and uh, restored riparian habitat that's that's in the Delta. So um, I want to recognize our project team. Firstly, Matt Graybaugh uh, with the Desert LCC. He helped extensively in this project and um, developed a lot of the ideas behind it. Um, Eliana Rodriguez and Jorge Ramirez from the University of Baja, California. They focus specifically on the ground mo groundwater modeling component of this project and um, they receive funding from a different source because they are a Mexican institution, just to make sure that's clear. And then Chad McKenna and Jacob Sherberg of Geosystems Analysis also helped out. Jeff Milliken of the Bureau of Reclamation, who is now retired. And then Francisco Zamorda of Sonoran Institute. So um, with this presentation, I'll, I'll first start with a little bit of background on the Colorado River Delta and provide some historic information as well as information on current conditions. Then I'll go into our project goals, methods, and results, and some of the management implications of, of this study. OK, there we go. So um, to give everyone a sense of, of the Colorado River Delta and its location, this map is of the Colorado River Basin. It shows the upper basin states and the lower basin states. And then this red box is the delta area, which is located in Mexico at the mouth of the river. And um, this map shows a satellite image of the delta region and, and essentially shows its conditions today, except for the fact that the, the river line is drawn over in blue. So there's not actually a running river in the Mexican portion of uh, the Colorado. And you can see. All of the green area in the satellite image is, is agricultural landscape. So um, a lot of the water that would be in the river is, is being applied to irrigate agricultural fields, which um, I'll be talking about in, in more detail throughout this, this presentation. Um, the delta historically was a 2 million acre expanse of marsh and riparian and estuarine habitat that was rich with diverse wildlife species. And if you can imagine, approximately 14 million acre feet of water annually was delivered to the delta, bringing with it a load of nutrients and sediment, and of course, essential water that 
um, this, the delta is located in the middle of a very arid region, so uh, water was critical. However, in about the mid-1900s, um, dams and diversions, large-scale dams along the Colorado River, particularly Hoover Dam and Glen Canyon Dam, um, meant that the river stopped flowing regularly to the delta and to the sea in about 1960. And so with the exception of some big flood flow years, um, you can see here in the, the 80s and the 90s, um, there, there really hasn't been a lot of surface water flows that have gone into the delta. And this has had dramatic impacts on the habitat, um, essentially reducing the, the amount of acreage to just 10% of its original size. So this image shows a before and after um, the reduction of surface flows. So the delta today is a different landscape. Um, the image on the top left here is the Colorado River at Mordello Dam. This is the last dam. Um, and I'm highlighting things with my cursor. I hope you all can see that. Um, this is the last dam on the Colorado River. It's at the border of, of the US and Mexico. And you can see that as water flows from the river in the US and, and goes into Mexico, basically all of the rest of the water that's remaining in the river at that point is essentially diverted into an irrigation canal. And so just a trickle flows into the river at the border. Um, so there's, there's some patches of, of remnant habitat in the delta that's largely supported by shallow groundwater. Um, but there are areas along the river where there are no, no surface, there's no surface water present, and it's a dry, sandy channel um, that's typically dominated by salt cedar, which is an invasive species. However, despite the, the degradation that's occurred in the delta, there are over 380 bird species that depend on this remnant habitat. And um, it's critical for, for wildlife in the region. So restoration and environmental flows would benefit wildlife and local communities greatly. Of course, the limiting factor is, is water. Um, surface flows to the region in the 80s and 90s, which I was showing in the, the chart showing flows over time, did regenerate a lot of habitat, um, which kind of awakened scientists and environmental groups to the idea that habitat in the delta is resilient and, and there is potential for restoration. Um, the, the key component, of course, is securing water for the region and, and then doing implementing restoration actions on the ground. Which brings me to Binational Agreement Minute 319. This was an agreement that was made in 2012 between the US and Mexico. And it was the first time in history that water was dedicated for ecological flows to the river um, in Mexico. And it was actually uh, the first transboundary water allocation for environmental purposes in the world. So this was a huge landmark agreement, um, very exciting. And the total water that was that is to be delivered over the course of the term, which is a five-year term, um, is about 158,000 acre feet. One third of those flows is to be delivered as base flows, and two thirds of those flows are to be delivered as a pulse flow. And the pulse flow was already delivered in the spring of 2014, perhaps. Some of you heard of that event. Um, and just to clarify, when I talk about a pulse flow, I'm talking about kind of a high magnitude release of water that's really meant to create new habitat and scour banks and, and allow seeds to germinate. Um, the base flow, the purpose of the base flow is to sustain existing habitat and sustain restored habitat. So these are low magnitude flows that are meant to, to really sustain groundwater levels and, and irrigate restoration sites. So um, with the potential new agreement coming at the end of this year, so Minute 319 expires this year, um, and considering all of the investments that have been made into restoration in the Delta, um, we're kind of at a critical point in, in assessing, you know, what is the sustainability of this habitat and making sure that it's protected into the, into the future. So 
we're expected to have more than 750 acres of riparian habitat restored by the end of this year and 900 by the end of 2018 in the Delta. Um, considering our, our financial and, and water resources that we're investing, you know, we, we want to think about um, groundwater dependent habitat in arid regions and uh, considering the lack of surface flows and uncertainty with impacts of ongoing drought and water scarcity, how vulnerable is this habitat to water management changes and in climate change? So now I'm going to get more into the project specifics and focus in on our study area and, and really look at kind of a reach-by-reach -reach basis of the Colorado River in Mexico because the eco-hydrological conditions are pretty variable along the river in Mexico and in particular groundwater conditions and um, this has significant ramifications for existing habitat and uh, restoration efforts. So this map shows the Colorado River divided up into seven reaches. The first reach starts at uh, right below Mordalos Dam, again the last dam of the Colorado and Reaches one and two are actually, they form the border between the U.S. and Mexico. The river is, is actually the border in those reaches. Um, reach three, I'll show some pictures in a little bit, is essentially the dry reach. There's not water in that reach. Um, reach four is, and reach five are what's considered the central delta region. And it's the location where we have a lot of existing restoration sites due to more suitable groundwater conditions. Reach 6 is located on a tributary of the Colorado in Mexico, the Hardy River, and then Reach 7 is, is the estuary region. So I just want to take you through um, some aerial images of each reach just to give you an idea of this variability that I'm talking about. This is Reach 1, which is located just below Mordelos Dam where we still have some seepage from, from the dam that's supporting riparian habitat and, you know, providing some surface water in the river channel. And you can see in this image some cottonwoods and, and mesquite and marsh areas. When we get to reach two, um, any surface flows that were coming from the dam are non-existent. And here we start to get into an issue of, of extremely deep groundwater table. Um, and you can see the dry, sandy channel um, and uh, tamarisk on either side of the channel, or a salt cedar. Reach 3 is um, essentially more of the same or even worse. The, the depth of groundwater in this reach is uh, extremely deep, and there's, there's even the, the salt cedar is less dense in this area because the groundwater conditions are, are not very favorable. When we get into reach four, however, um, we start to see some surface water present in the river channel, which this is the, the center channel going through here is actually the river channel, the main, main stem. And then we also have these old oxbows of the river, which have been disconnected over time, um, that our restoration efforts were reconnecting the channel and, and um, restoring habitat along these, these old oxbows. But you can see, Again, here we have some remnant riparian habitat that's, that's being sustained largely by shallow groundwater tables due to agricultural return flows. Um, without these return flows, uh, groundwater table would, would look very different. And so uh, this, is, this region is the central focus of our, our current restoration efforts. There's about 1,400 acres designated for restoration in the Laguna Grande restoration area. Um, and there's a bit more in upstream areas. So in, in this particular section of the river where we don't have surface flows and um, groundwater is so critical for sustaining habitat, you know, it's really important to understand some of, some of the dynamics going on behind the scenes. So groundwater concerns are, firstly, well, shallow, low salinity groundwater is needed to support riparian habitat. So cottonwood, willow, and mesquite species are phreatophytes, which means they obtain water from the phreatic zone, or the capillary fringe, 
which is a saturated soil layer just above the groundwater table. So they don't rely as much on precipitation. And um, in, in a functional river system, you know, you'd have river-based flows that would be maintaining um, shallow groundwater in riparian areas year-round. But again, with the, the lack of the surface flows, that's, that's not really the case in the delta. So um, agricultural return flows are maintaining these, these shallow groundwater levels. Um, the average, average precipitation in this region is about two inches per year, so that's not contributing much either. Um, additionally, as I said, we're targeting these areas for active restoration. Um, and so we have a range of factors that are influencing groundwater levels that most of them are beyond the control of the restoration site manager. So agricultural return flows, groundwater pumping, uh, local evapotranspiration, basin-wide precipitation, and then environmental flows, which um, site managers actually do have some control over that. And just to point out that um, water management changes are likely. So I just pulled this from High Country News. They, had a, they highlighted three recent articles about the West shrinking water supply to just um, show how climate change, uh, increasing temperatures are causing changes in, in the basin that are, are having huge impacts. So um, water restrictions due to shortages on the Colorado River could potentially cause reductions in agricultural return flows in this area. Um, groundwater pumping could increase, for example. Uh, evapotranspiration rates could in increase. And just to clarify, evapotranspiration is water evaporation from land surfaces and, and transpiration from plants. Um, so we could have increased evapotranspiration rates due to increasing temperatures or changes in vegetation cover, um, could have less precipitation. And so with all of these, these factors, our, our habitat that's reliant on groundwater is becoming increasingly vulnerable. So just to show our, our current study area, which is reach four of the, the Colorado River in Mexico, um, this map shows our network of pesometers in reach four. And actually, there are, there are more pesometers than this map shows now. We installed some more in our restoration sites. But um, these are the pesometers that we use data from in reach four for this project. So, just to give you an idea of what's currently going on in terms of groundwater monitoring, we're, we're looking at groundwater levels and salinity. We have a network of about 32 pesometers in reach four, and they're mostly focused in the Laguna Grande area. And the Laguna Grande area actually includes these three restoration polygons. These are land concession areas for restoration. So it includes Sila, Laguna Cori, and Laguna Larga. So these all make up the Laguna Grande area. And then we have Chaucé restoration site, which is a bit further upstream. Um, so, so right now, I mean, we are using results from, monitor, from our monitoring efforts to look at effects of irrigation and environmental flows and adaptively manage restoration sites. But modeling was really needed to predict potential future impacts of groundwater decline on habitat. And so our project goals were to um, firstly do an analysis of historic and current conditions. So we used literature values, on-site observations, uh, remote sensing results to establish groundwater depth thresholds for riparian plants in the delta. Um, secondly, we, we refined an existing groundwater model to predict mean monthly groundwater depths under different input combinations based on realistic drivers. And then thirdly, using the results from the first two parts, so using our groundwater thresholds that we developed that are delta specific or even reach for specific, um, and then combining those with our, our groundwater model output, then we predict the extent of groundwater support for potential riparian habitat under the different scenarios. Um, so we define riparian habitat as including aquatic, 
cottonwood, willow, and mesquite cover types. And um, just one small note, too, is that we, we use this project to predict groundwater support essentially in, in the times between pulse flow events. So we didn't take into, into account any data from the pulse flow event or uh, historic um, surface flow events because we, we really wanted to focus more on um, this time when, when the groundwater and base flows are, are sustaining habitat. Um, so that's a little side note. Okay, so getting now into the first component, our groundwater threshold analysis. The goal of this analysis was really to correlate our, our pre-pulse flow groundwater elevations with the locations of remnant riparian vegetation to determine specific groundwater thresholds for different habitat types in the delta. And um, there are, of course, you know, numbers out there in the literature. Um, we did this analysis for mesquite and cottonwood willow habitat types because these are a bit more variable in the literature and, and it tends to be a little more site specific as to what these thresholds are. Um, we didn't conduct this analysis for marsh or open water as these are more well defined and less site specific. So um, looking at our methods, we, we first did a review of a lot of different data from 2005 to 2014 and reach for to look at trends and determine the period with the greatest depth of groundwater so we could start to um, hone in on those, those thresholds. And then for this, we ended up using uh, 25 piezometers with historic data between 2005 and 2007. And that, that was the, the deepest groundwater period for those piezometers. Um, using that data set, we then found the maximum groundwater depth for each piezometer during the peak of the growing season. So that included the months of May through September. And then we created a groundwater, depth of groundwater interpolation based on these values. Um, fortunately, we, we had a great resource available to us through existing vegetation maps of REACH4 that were based on um, 2014 LIDAR data and spectral imagery that Jeff Milliken at the Bureau of Reclamation created as part of the, the Minute 319 monitoring effort. So that was extremely helpful. Um, and we were able to overlay, sorry, overlay that vegetation data with um, our groundwater interpol interpolation. Um, and we, we had both canopy level scale classifications and then Anderson OMART structural level classifications as well for the vegetation maps. Um, and so using that overlay of the vegetation and our groundwater surface, we were then able to assess the relationship between depth of water and vegetation. Um, and then we, we used statistical analyses to determine that relationship. We used an occupancy analysis that was binned by 0.5 meter intervals depth of groundwater and then normalized our results. Um, and just to show an example of, this is one of the, the piezometer transects for the year 2006, and um, just showing the, the trend of groundwater in this area. So there's a very seasonal trend that is very much in accordance with the agricultural irrigation um, calendar. So you have the highest levels, um, around May, which is when there's peak irrigation, and then lowest levels actually in November. Um, but then within when we bend it in the, the growing season, our, our peak, or sorry, our maximum depth of groundwater during the growing season was actually in September, which is represented with these yellow triangles. Oh, and that shows the location of, of that transect, which is right in the heart of the Laguna Grande restoration site. Okay. So now looking at some results from our groundwater threshold analysis. Um, this is showing the relative frequency or occupancy of cottonwood and willow within these different depth of groundwater categories. And what we found is that relative occupancy 
of cottonwood willow, it stayed above the 50% line up to 2.5 um, meters set to groundwater. So you have a kind of a threshold there. And then with mesquite, it stayed above 50 up to 4 meters set to groundwater. So using this information and then also considering um, the restoration site design criteria that we're currently using in, our, in Sonoran Institute's restoration sites, um, we determined that we would use 2.5 meters depth of groundwater for the threshold for cottonwood and willow and 4 meters for mesquite. So um, this was a, a good exercise that essentially validated <laughs> our, our restoration um, site design criteria as well with, with actual vegetation and, and historic groundwater data um, from, from the specific area. Now getting into the groundwater modeling component. And again, um, the University of Baja California did the, the groundwater modeling of this project. Um, they used an existing groundwater model that Eliana Rodriguez created in 2011. And this just shows some of the data sets that she used, conductivity, uh, pumping, and then recharge values. And this is the final um, parent and child model. And she actually refined the child model also in REACH4. So that's the final model domains. And then now getting into more complicated part of determining what our model inputs would be and how we would vary those based on um, given the, the drivers that we wanted to consider. So um, all of our input categories on the left here are factors that impact groundwater. Um, instead of having a, dif a different input level for each specific driver, we decided to simplify the modeling and reduce the number of scenarios by, by kind of combining similar drivers that could cause increases or decreases from a baseline level for each input category. So for example, um, with agricultural return flows, we, we used a baseline that was determined um, from the literature values and, and using uh, data from CONAGUA, which is the, the National Water Commission in Mexico. Um, we had an amount of 20% return of the 2005-2006 agricultural deliveries. Increased was 30% of that return, and the decrease was 15% of that return. And I'm going to present the actual volumes um, for these inputs in the next slide. So what can be causing those, those increases and decreases could be, for example, um, irrigation efficiency projects where there's canal lining that could actually you know, decrease the amount of, of water that's being recharged to groundwater and available to, to riparian species. Um, land following or also water transfers out of a basin. Um, there could be changes in crop type, which would actually potentially increase agricultural return flows if, they, if farmers need to apply more water. Um, and then ground pump, groundwater pumping could also be a decreaser. For riparian corridor ET, um, we used estimates developed and used by the, the Bureau of Reclamation for Lower Colorado River Water Accounting, um, and then tweaked those based on um, estimates of, of ET reduction by uh, defoliation of salt feeder. If the, the salt feeder beetle arrives to the delta, which is it is supposed to do in the next five to 10 years, um, we included that as a, a factor that could decrease ET. Um, for in, increased ET, we considered uh, changing over salt cedar habitat to native riparian habitat. Um, so there could be uh, you know, changes in vegetation cover, which would cause increases in ET. Um, in, also, increases in temperature could cause uh, increased ET values. So, um, looking at our environmental flow deliveries component, these values were based on um, 
essentially volumes that could potentially be observed in the next binational agreement. And um, one thing to note is that the, for the none category, this is not actually the baseline as we are including, or we are currently using um, applying environmental flows to restoration sites. So in this case, there isn't a baseline. We have just a none category for, for environmental flows because we wanted to be able to observe um, what the impact of that would be and, and, and what that would look like. So um, increases or decreases could be caused by water leases, um, purchase availability, drought or water, short, water shortage conditions, or infrastructure limitations. Um, so one thing I, I'm not sure I mentioned before is that the the Colorado River Delta Water Trust, which is a coalition of, of non-governmental organizations, including Sonoran Institute, is actually um, purchasing water in the Mexicali Valley and dedicating that uh, to the river and to restoration sites. And there, the Water Trust is actually um, the third party in the agreement of Minute 319 who is on the line to provide uh, water to the delta in the form of, of the base flow. So, sorry, I thought I should have mentioned that before in the introduction, but um, one thing to note is, is that um, the, the Delta Water Trust is would basically be applying these amounts that we're seeing in the um, environmental flow delivery category. And then looking at our upstream subsurface flow category, we have, um, for the baseline we used, pre-2014 upstream groundwater levels. And again, the, the 2014 was the pulse flow delivery, so this is just before a pulse flow. Um, decreased upstream subsurface inflow. We used the lowest upstream groundwater levels in data record. And then increased, we used 2014 to 2015 upstream groundwater, groundwater levels. And for this category, we're, we're basically just talking about um, any subsurface flows that are coming in from upstream of reach four. So factors that could influence this component are um, similar for uh, agricultural return flows, but just applied upstream. So any groundwater pumping that's going on upstream, uh, reduced agricultural flow application, upstream environmental flows, or extreme weather events could affect this category. Okay, and um, I'm not going to get into the details of how each, um, how we developed actual values for each for each model input, but I do want to show um, some of the the curves for vegetation ET and show um, how we we kind of came to these. Um, values for this particular input, just because it's kind of neat. So um, this this graph shows monthly evapotranspiration for three cover types. Um, the non-salt seeder slash salt seeder that's cover, converted to riparian habitat is one of them. Um, the second one is just salt seeder, and then the third one is defoliated, defoliated salt seeder. That would be um, if, if the salt cedar beetle arrives and defoliates salt cedar. And to get these monthly estimates, we, we use the back, back of the envelope calculations and basically applied percent reduction by month that was taken from the literature. Um, we applied those to delta ET rates to get um, a monthly ET estimate. And so what we can see um, is that basically from May on through November, we can see that salt eater beetle is affecting um, ET. And actually, when you have uh, riparian habitat or non-salt eater, um, those have a higher monthly ET rate. This curve um, is just showing cumulative evapotranspiration in acre feet. So um, what it's saying is that salt eater beetle, beetle effects aren't too significant in terms of actual acre feet uh, of water that's going to be reduced um, with defoliation. 
whereas with corridor enhancement, we're actually going to see um, a bit more water use as compared to baseline soil cedar cover. So that's, that's just one um, example of how some of these inputs were developed. Uh, we spent a lot of time, and <laughs> Matt spent a lot of time and, and research looking into um, a lot of these factors. So uh, you can definitely look at our full report if you want more information on, on any of these things, including uh, more information on, on the model specifically as well. Um, so as promised, here are the model inputs showing uh, the actual volumes for each input level. Um, and this table is interesting because you can, you can just see the difference in magnitude of these inputs. For example, agricultural return flows, when we look at a difference from baseline to increased, we can see that there's a difference of nearly 11,000 acre feet. Um, we go from increased to reduced, that, that difference is close to 20,000 acre feet. So there's a big magnitude uh, as compared to riparian corridor changes, which are on the scale of, you know, 3,000 3, acre feet. Um, environmental flow deliveries are, are more comparable to the agricultural return flows. Um, so just, just to give you an idea of the actual, the volumes that we're talking about here. And also just to note that the volumes for riparian corridor ET are um, not the actual input volumes for the model uh, since we applied them based on a fractional cover of, of vegetation for each model cell, but um, not getting into those details. So now moving on to uh, our scenario selection. So looking back at our matrix here, we had four input categories with three input levels each. That's a total of 81 different combinations and 81 scenarios. So we did not have the time or the money to do <laughs> to run all 83 of those scenarios through the model. And so we did kind of an initial um, run of scenarios to get a sense of, of how important uh, the different components were on basically the significance on, on groundwater levels so that we could then move on with some additional scenarios based on, you know, how, how much each category was influencing levels. So our initial scenarios included um, a, lot of, a lot of the baseline factors. So our first scenario was, was baseline. So we had all components at baseline, no environmental flows. And then all of the other scenarios were keeping everything at baseline, but then tweaking just one, one of the categories with an increase or decrease. So for example, increased ag return flows or decreased ag return flows. And this was essentially um, to allow us to kind of isolate uh, the significance of, of each factor and then use that going forward in, in our additional scenario selection. OK, so to get an initial kind of assessment of these results, we found uh, difference to baseline figures particularly helpful. So we took our baseline scenario and we took groundwater elevation um, in the baseline and then we subtracted out groundwater elevation from the different scenarios so that we could determine, for example, when we decrease agricultural return flows and keep all components at, at zero or baseline, what are the what are the changes as compared to the baseline scenario um, in groundwater elevation? And we can see in this map here that in the lower portion of reach four, we get a difference of, of up to 0.8 meters depth to groundwater. So the decreased ag scenario is, is actually causing a, a decrease in groundwater by, by 0.8 meters as compared to the baseline. When we look at the increased agricultural return flow scenario, we see an, an increase in about 1.3 meters in the lower portion of, of reach four, which is significant. So what we took from this is that, I mean, obviously increasing and decreasing ag return flows is having a huge impact on, on groundwater levels and is something that we um, 
want to look at in, in additional scenarios as well. On the other hand, when we looked at decreased and in, increased ET while keeping all other components at baseline, um, we found that it, it didn't really have any impact on groundwater levels as compared to the baseline. Um, so this told us that you know, going forward with other scenarios, modifying ET wasn't really going to make a big difference. So we kept ET at baseline for the additional scenarios that we ran. When we looked at low environmental flows, we saw an increase in the lower portion of reach 4 of about 0.6 meters. When we increased the upper boundary condition or the upstream subsurface inflows, we saw an increase of about 0.5 meters in the topmost portion of reach 4 and, and not much difference um, in the lowermost portion of reach 4. So these factors were um, somewhat significant, and we wanted to include them. And so using this information and, and also thinking about you know, what, what we wanted to, to get out of this project and what we were most interested in, we proposed an additional four scenarios to run, uh, the first being the absolute worst case, where we have decreased agricultural return flows. We kept baseline ET because it, it didn't have significant impacts, no environmental flows, and we decreased upstream inflows. Number 11 was essentially the worst case, but we added low environmental flows. So this had decreased ag um, and decreased upstream inflows and then low environmental flows. And the same plus high environmental flows. Um, and then we wanted to also kind of isolate, because agricultural return flows appeared to have such a huge impact, we wanted to kind of isolate, isolate that and, and see how the environmental flows could could mitigate groundwater declines caused just by the agricultural decreases. So um, we did a low and high environmental flows for the last two scenarios. OK, so to analyze our model results, we looked at um, the mean monthly groundwater elevation for each model cell. Um, and then we subtracted the ground surface using our LIDAR data to obtain the depth of groundwater. Um, and we specified it was for the month of, of September because this was the maximum depth during the grow, growing season. Um, and that's also the reason why in that chart I showed previously, the table I showed previously with the volumes of water, I included the month of September in there too along with a, a annual total volume, so in case you were confused, that's why. And um, then we, we summarized the groundwater depth conditions and habitat support for the reach and restoration sites. And so I'm going to now start getting into our results. Um, we have a variety of ways that we looked at these results, and um, I'm just going to be talking through each of those. So. This graph shows depth of groundwater um, in, in 0.5 meter increments, and it shows the cumulative percent of the land area in reach for that falls within each of those categories. So um, a few things to note here is that, firstly, as we would expect, um, agriculture increase and decrease are, are really um, very significant factors. Um, when we look at the uh, worst case scenario, which is this purple line here, which also has increased upstream inflows, it's not really that much different than the, the decreased ag scenarios or decreased ag scenario. Um, other things to note are that uh, the high environmental flow scenario and the low environmental flow scenario are extremely similar. Um, there wasn't that much difference in, in depth of groundwater based on this model, at least. And then um, another takeaway is that we really don't have that much percent land area that's falling under um, a depth of groundwater of zero. So anything below zero would be considered either marsh or open water habitat. 
and there's not that much area that's that's falling under there. Um, probably because we we think this is because uh, for our lidar data we only had bathymetry for the river channel itself, and we didn't have bathymetry for all of the um, meander areas or, or historic river oxbows that are out there that, that do often have uh, surface water present. So some of those areas might not have had an accurate, um, basically, ground elevation that, that could be influencing the depth of groundwater results that we're seeing here. So this, this means that we probably have less area than in reality for our aquatic habitat types. This chart is just simplification of the last chart. It pulls out some of the key representative scenarios. So um, here we have the increased agricultural return flows, decreased agricultural return flows, um, our low environmental flows, and then the baseline and what's interesting here is that when we have a, a decreased agricultural return flows and low environmental flows to mitigate those impacts, we can see that um, essentially there's very little difference now between that scenario and the baseline scenario, which is um, an interesting result. So then the next step was to use this depth of groundwater uh, data and reclassify it into our, our habitat categories and then predict uh, the extent of, of riparian habitat in REACH4. Um, and so again, here are our, our categories that we use that were based on the threshold analysis and then also you know, thinking about our restoration site criteria, um, aquatic habitat, which again, we lumped open water and marsh into this category just because we, there, there wasn't a lot of area that was below zero meters depth of groundwater, and so um, this allowed us to to have to have a group that we're actually able to visualize um, when we look at acreages. Um, and then cottonwood willow habitat was between zero and 2.5 meters. Mesquite bosque was between 2.5 and four, and then um, non-riparian habitat was greater than four. This chart shows um, based on those. Uh, uh, habitat classifications, the amount of area within REACH4 in acres for each habitat type for each scenario. Um, so again, uh, we're basically repeating our conclusions from the results that, you know, we can see here increased, decreased ET doesn't really differ from the baseline. Uh, increased ag, we're seeing a, a lot more cottonwood willow habitat. Um, with uh, environmental flows, we're seeing similar levels of mesquite bosque habitat as increased ag, but, but not as much cottonwood willow habitat and not as much aquatic either. Um, and in general, you can see, again, that the aquatic habitat is just, it's, there's not that much area present. Um, and this, this table just gives you uh, hard numbers for, for the acres, um, again, showing those uh, more representative scenarios, the baseline, increased ag return flows, decreased ag return flows, low environmental flows, and then decreased agricultural return flows plus low environmental flows. Um, and I'm going to keep moving on so we have time for questions. Um, now I'm going to show a series of maps, which I think are definitely the coolest representation for our results. Um, this is at the reach scale. Here's the baseline extent of habitat for um, the different classifications that we have. So this is basically showing habitat potential for the different scenarios. So here's our baseline. Here's the worst case scenario. So you can see going from baseline to the worst case, we see a lot more orange, which is the non-riparian category. Um, increased ag, we get uh, increase of mesquite bosque and, and cottonwood willow. And also, you can see some aquatic going on in the, in the river channel itself. And now we're looking at uh, the site scale. This is the Laguna Grande restoration site, which again includes these three concession polygons and um, gives you a, a closer look at, at some of the, the extent of habitat. So 
Again, baseline scenario, uh, decreased ag where we have, sorry, I forgot to point out um, the different colors. So green is cottonwood willow, uh, yellow is mesquite bosque, and orange is, is non riparian, light blue is aquatic. So uh, again, baseline to decreased ag, we're seeing a huge increase in the non riparian habitat and decreases in cottonwood willow and mesquite bosque. When we add low environmental flows to that decreased ag, we essentially go back to the baseline scenario extent, which is what we saw in the other charts as well. Increased ag, we just see a whole lot of cottonwood willow and mesquite bosque, which is pretty fun, and some aquatic habitat. And the low environmental flows, we, we do see uh, an increase in, in those, those habitat types as well, not as much as when we increase ag. but um, okay, so to, to put into summary what I've been saying, um, agricultural return flows were the most significant factor that was influencing groundwater. And again, this is not really surprising considering the, the volumes that we're talking about, um, like I showed in the, in the chart um, following the, the scenario matrix. Um, we also saw that, that ET change had no, no impact on groundwater depth, and this means that the salt cedar beetle, beetle is actually unlikely to impact groundwater availability too much. Um, low and high environmental flow amounts had similar impacts on groundwater levels, and environmental flow deliveries did have the potential to mitigate negative impacts of groundwater decline that were caused by uh, ag return flows. Um, and just to note, uh, a few caveats is that you know these results are really specific to our groundwater model and the methods that we use to integrate the model inputs. And I, I think you know one limitation was that the surface water inputs were incorporated um, by specifying river surface elevations based on HECRAS simulations. And so you know we're not really capturing real surface water groundwater interactions. Um, and uh, the the fact that there was no difference between the low and high environmental flow amounts, I, I'm not sure that's that's what we would see on the ground based on um, our, our previous observations of even just low low magnitude low magnitude flows delivered uh, to the river channel. Um, we we did see a difference, and we have seen a difference in groundwater on the range of 0.5 to 1.5 meters. So. Based on that, we might expect that scenarios with high environmental flows would be a bit different than the low environmental flows, but that was not the case under this model. Um, and then again, you know, with, with the lack of, of change based on the lack of groundwater level change from ET inputs, this is likely due to the fact that it's just the volume that we're talking about uh, going from increase to decrease scenarios is is of much lesser magnitude than, let's say, for example, the, the changes in ag return flows. So, okay. Now, um, to conclude, uh, when we look at cottonwood willow habitat as compared to the mesquite bosque, we, we see that it's slightly more resilient to groundwater decline caused by ag return flow decreases. Um, so, you know, mesquite bosque was, was decreasing uh, at a greater extent than, than the cottonwood willow habitat when we reduced uh, groundwater levels. Um, what's clear is that protected, dedicated environmental flows will be critical to sustain habitat into the future. Um, additionally, there's, there's great potential for expanding cottonwood and willow habitat if current groundwater levels are augmented. And then lastly, continual monitoring and adaptive management of habitat and environmental flow deliveries will be needed to respond to future changing groundwater conditions, which is certain to occur. And uh, thinking beyond just the delta and you know, reach for in the delta and applying this to other areas, um, we can certainly use this information for restoration planning, including site selection and long-term irrigation needs. Uh, it can be used to maximize benefits of future environmental flows and mitigate potential negative impacts of climate change and reduced ag agricultural return flows. 
And then this is a great example of, of how data and modeling could be used to inform binational water policy. So if, if a new agreement is made, this data could uh, help to inform a, an environmental flow delivery plan um, in the future. And then lastly, it's important to, to use an adaptive management framework to, to test out flow volumes and delivery points in the future. So with that, um, I want to acknowledge our funders, the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative and our match funder, the Lincoln Institute. And then the last three here are, are folks that helped uh, provide information for the study. Um, so thank you very much. And we have a few minutes for questions. Great, thank you, Karen. Thank you for the presentation. Um, do you know environmental flows are something that we're especially interested in um, in the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative and uh, appreciate the, the results of this project. Uh, we do have a few minutes for questions and uh, we have a couple coming in already. Um, if folks have additional questions, feel free to put those in the chat box. Um, Karen, the first question was um, uh, some confusion on our definition of environmental flows for the Delta. Can you can you recap uh, again what we're considering, considering environmental flows and then maybe how those were included in the model? Yes. So um, we considered environmental flows in the delta to be pulse flows, which is a high magnitude flow um, that's probably more infrequently delivered, at least for the delta. Um, a base flow can be low magnitude flows that are delivered either directly to the river channel to, with the purpose of sustaining riparian habitat, or they can be delivered to um, the old river oxbows, where there's habitat, uh, remnant habitat there as well. And then it also includes irrigation water for restoration sites. So we have, we have some restoration sites that are, you know, we, we deliver flows through the irrigation canals in Mexicali so that um, we're able to target riparian habitat that we've restored uh, pretty specifically. Is that yep, that's, thank you, Karen. Um, yep. The next question is something I was looking at earlier, um, but the conclu conclusion that mesquite habitat is more sensitive to changes in groundwater elevation in the riparian corridor. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, my initial take on this, and feel free to expand on it, Karen. Um, you know, I think the the Codwin willow habitat potential is primarily in the areas that are really low um, already, mm -hmm. so down in the bottom of the river channel and the oxbows, whereas a lot of the potential mesquite habitat is up in the higher flat areas. Um, and those flat areas are already kind of on the cusp of being um, too deep depth groundwater to support mesquite. So when the mm -hmm. groundwater goes down just a little bit, there are much larger blocks of area that are taken out of habitat potential. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's why the magnitude is so much higher for mesquite. Um, anyway, I kind of stole the mic there, Karen. Um, do you have <laughs> that's, that? that's okay. Yep, I agree. And I would just note that it's it's also interesting that we have there's very little existing mesquite boss habitat along the river in Mexico currently, and uh, you know it's interesting to see the model suggesting that this this habitat type could be more sensitive to groundwater change. Um, it looks like it that might actually be reflected on the ground already. So, yeah, just to note that. Okay, thanks, Karen. Um, give it another minute for questions. If anybody else has anything in the chat box, uh, Dale Turner chimed in also about the question for Mesquite, and hopefully that covered it. Um, Karen, maybe if you toggle back to the baseline versus low flow habitat potential, um, you can kind of see where that change happened. Um, we'll get there. Um, and while you're playing with that, Karen, um, another question mm -hmm. is uh, not necessarily directly related, but are you aware of a resource or website where we can get water quality data for the upper Sea of Cortez? Um, and the question, I guess, is more specifically related to um, how environmental flows can impact health in the estuary. Mm -hmm. um, we, we are working with various groups and we're working ourselves to collect data on um, water quality in, in the upper estuary. Um, 
the the flows from the Colorado River uh, often don't don't really make it down to the estuary, so um, it's kind of an unrelated topic. But um, there's definitely flows from the Hardy River and uh, agricultural drains that are, are flowing into the, the estuary. And, and we do have, have data on that. Um, so whoever asked that question, I can talk more with that person about accessing that data later. Great. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, I agree. I think the whole estuary water quality issue is a, would be a great webinar in itself. Um, mm -hmm. Next question is from Julia Fonseca. Um, Karen, something that we talk about all the time, um, but Julie is asking if we have some remarks about agricultural efficiency programs and agricultural following. Um, like its impacts on on habitat specifically, or I like so I think programs that are going on right now, or um, I think it's a relatively open ended. So it was just some remarks: <laughs> okay. efficiency programs and ag following. Okay, so my interpretation will be that um, there are some ag efficiency projects planned for the Mexicali Valley. Um, they were actually supposed to be part of Ministry 19, and they, they haven't happened yet. I'm not sure what the timeline is for those at this point, but but I think you know it, it's probably fair to say that that's going to happen in the future. Um, I will say though that. Uh, I'm talking specifically about a project that's going to be a canal lining project. I will say that agricultural irrigation uh, efficiency in the Mexicali Valley is already quite efficient. So um, I think there's like 10% uh, percolation or, or loss versus like 40% in um, the uh, Central Valley in California. So, um, and Matt, correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, it's already fairly efficient. Um, despite despite that, I think we do need to be planning for potential projects down the line that that could negatively impact or you know decrease groundwater levels, particularly in the central delta region, and, and then you know have impacts on on habitat there. Right. And um, Karen, you know I can't not chime in on this issue. So briefly, um, <laughs> you know. Uh, I think a lot about agricultural efficiency and impacts on riparian areas. Um, and one of the unique things about the Delta, I think, is that uh, when we present this, we're talking about how um, inefficient agriculture is actually benefiting the riparian ecosystem, which right. throws a lot of people off. Um, and it's you know taken me a little while to figure out how to have that discussion. I think the question really is with agricultural efficiency projects, uh, the question is, what is done with that water that is saved through the efficiency improvement projects? So in the case of this pro uh, this modeling project, we're assuming that any increase in agricultural efficiency, that water is taken out of the basin and, and applied somewhere else. Uh, of course, if that agricultural savings was instead diverted and put back into the river as environmental flows, then um, the efficiency improvements, of course, uh, would improve the ecological conditions as well. So. In my mind, it's more about what you do with the water that's saved with those projects as far as the, the impacts. Um, yep. Any other last-minute questions? We're a couple minutes over here. Um, but anything else people would really like to ask? All right. Without, I don't see anybody else typing, so I think we'll go ahead and end it here. Um, I want to thank you all again for attending this presentation. Uh, Karen, thank you for leading us through the webinar. Really appreciate it, and I'm glad to see um, some useful uh, products coming out of this project. As a quick reminder, uh, this webinar will be available on the YouTube um, site um, within a week or so, and we'll send out an announcement once that link is live as well. And with that, uh, thank you all again. I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.